that's not my area of तो हेलो स्टूडेंट्स सर काफी कम बच्चे हैं थ्री और फोर में भी तो विल कीप दिस सेशन एज अ डिस्कशन सेशन तो इफ एनीबडी हैज एनी डाउट दे कैन आस्क और एल्स वी कैन प्रोसीड विद द लास्ट प्रीवियस प्रेजेंटेशंस व्हाट एवर वी हैव कवर्ड इन द लास्ट फोर वीक्स ओके एल फर्स्ट आई विल गिव यू द ओवरव्यू what we have discussed in the last four weeks so let me share the presentation then we'll start then we'll uh, cover all your doubts just let me know if my screen is visible or not so anyone in the chat box or unmute your screen just tell me is my visible it's visible so in the last previous session we have covered the topics nanoparticles synthesis characterization and data processing and the next topic was dna nanotechnology and the third topic was nano materials for cancer diagnosis and therapy the last session which we have covered is uh, nano pharmacology the targeting in nanotechnology we'll start with the first one nano particles synthesis characterization and data processing so in this portion uh, First, just let me know if you have covered all the or not. So, Vijay Chitra, were you present in all the session? Uh, no, Uncle Mr. Angad, I I'm not present. So you are not this audible. You are not uh, audible. Session. Keep your mic. Uh, this is the first session I'm attending. Okay. Can you session. hear me? Yeah, 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 because uh, I I haven't uh, attended any uh, discussion sessions, okay, okay, so cool. I thought uh, this session will be useful uh, for in the so, exam point of view. Just uh, I'm just letting you know, just so that I'll uh, cl clarify and just go through all the points thoroughly. That's some. But Ishina, did you covered all the sessions, last sessions? No, sir, it's my second session. Okay, this is your second session. Sun Sanjit, did you cover all the sessions? 
No, so it's second for me too. Okay, it's second for you also. Anitka? Nitha, am I audible to you? Okay, I think there's some problem on my side. Reshma, so is this your first session or you also covered some of the sessions previously? Reshma. So see according then I'll cover all the topics and slides. Reshma, am I audible to you? You cannot opt it to unmute your mic, you can also drop your message in the chat box. Nitha and Reshma. are not responding so let's start with the presentation then as some of you have this this is the first session of students so let's start with the deep slides then yeah. so in the first topic we have covered the nanoparticles its synthesis characterization and data processing so in that presentation we have covered introduction to nanoparticles its method for synthesizing nanoparticles techniques for characterizing nanoparticles data processing of nanoparticles based experiment so in that we have covered the nanoparticles are particles with the size range typically 1 to 100 nanometers they can be made up of variety of materials and are incredibly small they are too small to be seen with the naked eyes they are only visible with advanced microscope microscopes like tamsam afm so nanoparticles exhibit unique and often enhanced properties due to their small size and high surface to volume ratio which can differ significantly from those of their bulk counterparts. So these structures can be engineered from a variety of materials including metals, metal oxides, polymers and many more. So the properties of nanoparticles are strongly influenced by factors such as size, its shape, its composition and its surface characteristics. So as a result, they have found applications in various fields, including medicines, electronics, energy and material science. Nowadays, this nanotechnology is transferred to agriculture also. Uncle sir? Uh, yes? Uh, I have, I have it. Uh, we go to the previous slide. Okay. Sorry to interrupt you. Uh, it's okay, it's completely fine. You can ask where, wherever you have doubt. Yeah, okay. Uh, so here the properties of nanoparticles are influenced by size, shape, composition, and surface characteristics. Yeah, your so voice is not that... your voice is not that clear. Just uh, keep your microphone just closer to your. Sure, sure. Mm, yeah. Um, the size, shape, composition, and surface characteristics. So, which of these factors will strongly influence, or which will have a major uh, impact on the property? All the factors are equally influenced for its characteristics, like size and shape. So, uh, size is the major factor. Hmm. The first major factor is okay. size. See, if okay. you have nanoparticles, which are not in the size range of below 100 nanometer. So, we can call any particle as a nano just because of its size. If it's not in its, uh, if it's not below 100 nanometer, it will not call be as nano nanoparticle. So, the major uh, properties, it's size. Then after size, sh its shape matters. Some metallic nanoparticles are in triangular shape, some of are in square shape. So the uh, circular nanoparticles have the more surface surface to volume area. So the first major factor is size, followed by its shape, then composition and surface characteristics. So am I clear? Who have Am I clear to you? Okay, Vijay. So, the next is types of delivery system compared to in comparison to nanotechnology. So, first we had a conventional drug delivery systems in which we had ointments, tablets, capsules, and syrups, which you can see in your daily life. Then the controlled release drug delivery system. Then nowadays the hot topic called as nanomedicine based drug delivery system. So in conventional drug delivery system, orally consumption of tablets, capsules, syrups, damaged by enzymatic reactions and lower environment. So to overcome these things, to overcome this conventional drug delivery system things, we have created controlled release drug delivery system. In this system, it's confronting as drug aggregation due to large sizes of matrices, delay in release time and less soluble and less targeted. 
and to and nowadays to overcome this less targeted thing and less solubility things will uh, we we have developed nano medicines and nano medicine is the target specific like control drug delivery system it was uh, like it's, it's prolonged and sustained it was there was no uh, targeted things was there for targeting any tumor targeting any specific site we have uh, researched this nano medicine things so it is targeted it, it is target specific transport drug to affected areas without damaging any healthy cells then the example of nano medicine drug delivery systems are gold nanoparticles carbon nanotubes liposomes and dendrimers so now types of nanoparticles so basically there are three types of nanoparticles polymeric nanoparticles inorganic nanoparticles and lipidic based nanoparticles so in polymeric nanoparticles are some of our polymerism dendrimers polymer micelle nanospheres in organic in in organic we can use any metal called uh, known as silica nanoparticles quantum dots iron oxide nanoparticles gold nanoparticles zinc oxide nanoparticle silver nanoparticles and many more in lipidic based uh, nanoparticles are liposomes lipidic nanoparticles and emulsion oil in water emulsion or water in oil emulsion both so then properties of nanoparticles so i have divided the properties of nanoparticles into four categories the first one is targeting ligands then surface chemistry composition and its physical properties so we'll start from targeting ligands targeting ligands some of our polymeric nanoparticles these have small molecules then nucleic acid protein peptides and antibodies targeting then its surface chemistry surface chemistry nanoparticles are basically of uh, you know visible due to this surface charge properties its surface functionality if you have any nanoparticles which have this kind of uh, surface moieties like amino acid carboxylic acid type of things then surface chemistry of nanoparticles can be changed then its hydrophobicity and hydrophilicity can be changed as per our requirement then its composition we can uh, compose the nanoparticles in any of the things like nano shells silica micelles viruses dendrimers and metallic forms then physical properties i told you know that uh, any nanoparticles can be in different shapes like spherical cubical rod shape triangular shapes mostly nanoparticles are in spherical shapes but metallic nanoparticles are in triangular shapes and cubical shapes also and the surface property of any nanoparticles can be rigid its uh, roughness of the nanoparticle and could be porous so then uh, method of synthesizing nanoparticles so there are three methods of synthesizing nanoparticles so the first one is chemical synthesis physical synthesis and biological synthesis we'll cover this topics in brief now so uh, in chemical synthesis we use any chemical reaction then lead to its coating process of with any polymers like lipid or polymerisomes etc then we we'll lead to the synthesis of any nanoparticles by using any chemical so it's called as chemical synthesis but in physical method we can use any external force rather than any chemical so like solvent plus metal we can use metal or propsonication which is enhanced or accelerated by any external force so this is called as a physical method of preparing nanoparticle then biological synthesis in biological synthesis we uh, synthesize the nanoparticle by using any natural extract like nowadays in some of my labs also some are preparing the nanoparticles by using leaf extract first they have taken leaves from any plants they'll boil it then will they take extract of that uh, leaf then put some drops of that in in some like silver nitrate solution then will lead to the formation of sol uh, silver nanoparticle so this kind of things are called as biological synthesis of nanoparticle so then uh, these are some of the examples of uh, nanoparticle synthesis through uh, various methods so these are the high energy ball milling method in physical method thin out gas condensation pulse vapor deposition laser pyrolysis flash spray pyrolysis electro spraying and melt mixing and in biological methods i think someone's mic is on mute then in biological uh, methods but microorganisms assisted biogenesis biotemplate assisted plant extract which whatever i have told you know 
plant extract can be. Then chemical methods, stole gel synthesis, microemulsion techniques, hydrothermal synthesis, polyol synthesis, chemical vapor synthesis, and plasma enhanced chemical vapor deposition. Now the important part of the uh, nanoparticles is, is its characterization. So suppose we have synthesized any nanoparticle. Then uh, we'll proceed for the characterization of that particular nanoparticle by using this instrument. The uh, instruments like UV visible spectrophotometer, DLS dynamic light scattering, zeta potential, FTIR, X-ray diffraction, scanning electron microscope, transmission electron microscope, HRTM, energy dispersal spectroscopy, EFM atomic force microscopy, and inductively coupled plasma spectroscopy and thermal spectroscopy. Now we'll discuss all this instrument in brief. So we'll start from uh, UV spectrophotometer. So in UV, this is the instrument of UV spectrophotometer. We'll keep our sample in this hole. Wait, let me just enlarge this. So this is the instrument of UV visible spectrophotometer. We'll use the liquid sample, uh, nearly 2 to 3 ml uh, liquid sample we can use for UV spectrophotometer. We'll pour our uh, liquid sample in the qubit and we'll place our qubit in this place. Then you can see the rays of UV, uh, UV can uh, pass that slit uh, through that uh, qubit. Then it will show the graphs like this. So in this example, uh, you can see the peaks are near to 425. So 425 is the characteristic peak of the particular chemical, particular nanoparticle on different time periods. So they have checked after the preparation of 10 minutes, they have checked after the preparation of 10, 20, 30, 40, 60 minutes. So there is a difference in the absorbance of the nanoparticle uh, based on time. Then DLS, dynamic light scattering. Suppose we have prepared the nanoparticle, so how can we confirm that this is a nanoparticle. This is exactly this is a nanoparticle. So for that we have to check its size. So for size we can use DLS dynamic light scattering. Dynamic light scattering is the principle of that particular instrument. So we'll use this kind of qubit. Then we'll place one ml of sample of our nanoparticle. Then we'll place our place this qubit into this place. Then this kind of this sort of result will come. That will uh, this peak will come. And the result quality must be good to consider it as a nanoparticle. So this is a Z average 65.18. This is the exact Okay, slide is not changing now. Huh? Let me reshare my screen. Wait. Is it visible now? Okay. So we're talking about this dynamic light scattering instrument. So this is the kind of results which we will get from dynamic light scattering instrument. So this is 65.18. This is the exact uh, size of the nanoparticle. This is the average size of the nanoparticle. So it will go through the three runs, then by running three runs, then it will give average size of that particular nanoparticle. So in this result, we, uh, we can see there are three things which we have to notice. The Z average size of that nanoparticle, which is 65.18, which confirms that this is, a part, uh, this is the final preparation of the nanoparticle. The size is below 100 nanometer. So which this we can consider as a nanoparticle. Then PDI. PDI is also the most important factor of the nanoparticle synthesis. So PDI is should be near 0.100, should be near. 0.1. So PDI 
shows us poorly disposed index that how uniformly nanoparticles are disposed in that uh, liquid medium it should be if it should be 0 0.100 that means that nanoparticles is in uh, uniformly distributed throughout the nanoparticle solution or medium then the result quality depending upon the average nanoparticle size and pdi then we'll conclude that result quality should be good then if this is good then we'll proceed for the further characterization like semdem and various characterization of nanoparticles so the next thing is zeta potential measurement so as you can see in uh, dynamic light scattering we have used the normal cuvet the new normal uh, glass uh, glass cuvet but in zeta potential the instrument is same the instrument will be same for the for this uh, dynamic light scattering and zeta potential but the only difference is coming this cuvet this cuvet had some electrodes this cuvet will come with some positive and negative electrodes and consists of this single capillary so this result for this also uh, come like uh, uh, dynamic light scattering so we'll pour 1 ml of sample in this cuvet then we'll put this cuvet into the dynamic light scattering instrument with the portion of that zeta potential measurement then the result will come like this so in this we can see the zeta potential is 49.9 so what does this mean 49.9 is what so this is the zeta potential value chart is given here if the zeta potential value comes between minus 10 to plus 10 it is highly unstable that uh, that you have prepared the nanoparticles and its zeta potential coming between minus 10 to plus 10 then it will be changing its size or changing its surface chart mean time in mean time after 2 days we will check the particle size the particle size will be get changed if the particle zeta potential is in between minus 20 to plus 20 then it will be called as relatively stable at no stable but relatively stable likewise minus 30 to plus 30 is moderately stable the ordinary particle zeta potential must be more than minus 30 to more than plus 30 if it is coming more than this uh, range then it will be considered as highly stable nanoparticle likewise this result is coming like 49.9 that means that nanoparticles prepared which we have prepared is highly stable if we'll check its nano uh, particle size on the first day it will be same after one year so the particle size will be remain same if its zeta potential value is more than minus 30 or more than plus 30 so then we'll the next is the ftir for it transform infrared spectroscopy hmm. so for uh, the ftir instrument we must use the solid sample so suppose we have prepared the nanoparticles it was in liquid form then we'll uh, convert or transform that liquid sample to the solid sample then we'll mix that solid sample or powder sample with kbr then we'll prepare one kbr pellet which will be used in the ftir spectroscope instrument so in ftir uh, the ftir result should look like this <clears throat> so uh, we have example of this folic acid and cytosine folate so as you can see some peaks are there some some uh, values are there what does this value means like we have 8381340292 likewise in cytosine folate we have some values yes vijay someone has raised his hand na okay so here you can see there is delay in slight sharing okay i'm using iit's wifi it is not simple okay let me just uh, shut down this presentation and i'll reopen this presentation just okay i think uh, you have to mm -hmm. uh you have to uh, put, uh click on the slide which is on the right side uh, uh, as it is not uh, a full power sh show okay 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 let me just uh, i think uh, maybe for you maybe for you it's visible yeah, for us it's not visible yeah it's time to time changing the slide <laughs> just give me a minute just resolve sure
think it will visible to all. So now is it visible? So it will after we'll change the slide, then we'll get to know. Okay, so we're talking about FTIR peak. So as you can see here. Uh, we have taken the example of folic acid and chitosan folate. So we got some values like 3, 4, 2, 6, 1, 6, 8, 9, 1, 6, 7, 0. What does that mean? So in FTIR, we just got the information about the functional groups present in that particular nanoparticle sample. So we have chart here. So the wavelength, the, the wave number ranges from the common functional groups. If we have peaks in between uh, 3500 to 3200, so that means that OH or any stretches are present there. The screen is visible now. Yes, okay. So if uh, some values are in between this 3200 and 2800, and must be CS stretches must be there. If the values in between this range, then this functional group must be there. If the ranges, uh, if the values in between this range then this stretches must be there and then values it below this thousand then this uh, functional group must be there so this FTR used to identify the functional group in that particular nanoparticle thing so the next is x-ray diffraction xrd so in xrd the types of sample required is the powder form or drop casted film so this is a visual representation of that particular instrument. How does it look like? Then we have some example of the peaks of XRD. So A, B, C, D. So this is a, a different batches of formulation, nano formulation. So as you can see, this is a broad peaks of that uh, nanoparticle things. And the broad peaks are some of the sharp peaks are also there. So in XRD, the broad peaks mean the nanoparticle nature is an amorphous form. Uh, two things are there amorphous and crystalline if the peaks are broad that means the nanoparticles is in amorphous form if the peaks of xrd is in sharp form that means it's semi, it's crystalline form so if we can see in example d in uh, a there is a single peak single broad peak is there and in d broad peak is also there and some of the sharp peaks are also there. that means the sample is semi crystalline some of the amorphous and crystalline nature is both the natures are there. So that sample we call semi-crystalline. So this types of nature of that uh, nanoparticles is identified by XR instrument. So the next most important thing is STEM, scanning electron microscope. So this is a visual representation of scanning electron microscope. This is how does it look like. Then the sample preparation of uh, SAM instrument. So suppose we have a liquid sample of nanoparticle. We'll drop cast that liquid sample into a glass slide. Then we'll leave it for 24 hours to evaporate the ethanol or solvent from that. Then it will get dry through 24 hours. Then this is the principle of scanning electron microscope. So this is a sample holder of that scanning electron microscope. What we usually do in SAMNA We'll just keep on glass slide of one by one centimeter in square and we'll place our nanoparticles on that glass slide then we'll uh, copper coat copper coat or carbon coat or gold coat that nanoparticle with some instrument then this is a visual represent representation of that same image of nanoparticle so as you can see how clearly it's looking like see how fully disposed if, if you can see this uh, image now so the small size of nanoparticles are there in poly disposed, how uniformly disposed nanoparticles are there. And in this image, uh, let me enlarge this image. See how spherical it's looking like. So this information, the spherical shape, the size shape, size information will get from same image. So the next thing is energy disposal spectroscopy. So we can call this EDS, SEMEDX, EDAX. There's a lot of name of this in this technique. So through this energy disposal spectroscopy, we get to know about the element present in the nanoparticle 
solution or sample. So suppose we have prepared some uh, bimetallic gold silver nanoparticle. So here they have identified some of the elements like silver, chlorine, copper, and carbon. So uh, wait, let me just tell you one thing. Also. The SEM and this EDX both are combined with each other. Suppose we have uh, obtained this image and SEM. Then we'll select this area. Then we'll get to know the information about elemental analysis in, of this particular area. Only. Suppose we have scanned this area and we'll just click the ADS system. Then we'll get to know about the element present in this particular area. Only. So this is the peaks of carbon, chlorine uh, uh, and silver. That means that silver is present in that particular nanoparticle. Likewise, carbon, oxygen, silver, copper are present in this particular sample. So the elemental analysis is done with this instrument, energy dispersal spectroscopy. And the next most important characterization is TEM, high resolution transmission electric microscopy. My screen is changing now, but time isn't there is any delay? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So this this is a visual representation of TEM. So this is how it looks like. So in SEM we have prepared the samples on glass slide, but in TEM we cannot use glass slide for its sample preparation. In TEM we have some different things are there called copper TEM grid. So this is the copper TEM grid. Let me enlarge it. Hmm. This is how the copper grid looks like. So there are various chambers in it. Rim markers, but the center mark is there. Hmm. So, uh, how does it? How does we prepare the sample of uh, transmission electron microscope? So, suppose we have some liquid sample of nanoparticle. So, we consider this drop of nanoparticle. We'll just pour that drop of nanoparticle on copper grid. Uh, then we'll leave that this for four to five hours. Let them dry. Then all the nanoparticles will adhere, adhere on this copper tam grid. After evaporation of all the liquid solvent, then we'll use this copper grid for the TEM analysis. So this is the kind of results which we'll get from the TEM electron microscopy, transmit electron microscopy. So the difference between SEM and TEM is the SEM will give the information of nanoparticle with a size range of more than 100 nanometer. It will, if this nanoparticle is, uh, is in range of 10 nanometer or 100 nanometer, it will show superficially, but the intense knowledge, intense morphology of that particular nanoparticle you will get from the TEM only. So as you can see the clear representation of nanoparticle, how particular does it look like? So see how spherical proper shape of the nanoparticle you will get to know about the stem. So the next is AFM, Atomic Force Microscopy. So by this instrument we used to we get to know the surface morphology of that particular nanoparticle, that how the roughness of that particular nanoparticle. From Tamworth, we'll get to know the size and shape, but from AFM, we'll get to know the porosity, its the roughness, its rigidity of that particular nanoparticle sample. So the sample preparation for SEM and AFM is similar. Uh, there's nothing different. The only difference between SEM and AFM is the copper difference, is the coating difference. In SEM, we used to do the coating of uh, carbon coating, gold coating or sputtering we can say. In AFM, there is no coating or no sputtering uh, will be there. So this is a visual representation of that AFM instrument. So this is the principal scanning probe of the AFM atomic force microscopy. And here uh, in AFM, how this scan is, suppose we have this glass light in which we have our uh, nanoparticle samples. One cantilever, as you can see this arrow, sharp material is cantilever, we call it cantilever in AFM, cantilever of AFM. So this cantilever uh, move around your sample and uh, read its surface morphology, that how rigid it is, how porous it is, how the, what is the roughness of that particular nanoparticle sample is there. So this information will get to know, uh, will get to know from this AFM. So this is the kind of result which we'll get from AFM. So in FM there are two kind of results are there, 2D FM and 3D FM. As you can see, in, this is the 2D FM, the upper one, and the lower one is the 3D AFM images of any nanoparticle. 
So the next is. Ah yes. Ah, uh, in the previous slide, ah, uh, in the ASM, ah, uh, the material uh, should have some property. Like, ah, uh, I went, ah, uh, I had a wrong, wrong answer for this when I attended the quiz. Like uh, conductors, I wrote the quiz answer conductor. The material should be the conducting not, material. I'm not under. Uh, you're not uh, audible completely. Can you just drop your message oh. in text chat box? Oh sure. No, the material should like be conducting it again. Okay, just. Sorry. The material should be a conducting material or no, 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 even no. a non-conducting. No, no, no. It could be anything. It could be conductive. It could be non-conductive. Anything. Anything. But uh, there was a question in the MCQ mm -hmm. where uh, it uh, it was asked like the AFM can be used for uh, this uh, conducting material. So I I wrote conducting. Mm -hmm. Then it was a wrong answer. But ah, the it, answer was it, semiconductor. Ah, obviously it's, it will go go wrong as a conductivity. It could be used as a semiconductor means it could be conductive, it could be non-conductive. Both can be used. So oh, it will go as a semiconductor. Hmm. Oh, oh. So it if you okay. have ticked non-conductivity, it's also wrong. If you have ticked conductivity, it's also wrong. It can consider both conductivity, conductive or non-conductive both. That's why it went as semiconductive. Am I clear? Okay. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Okay. So the nanoparticle used in the drug development drug delivery and treatment for several diseases so this is the application of nanoparticles so we can use the nanoparticle drug in carbon nanotubes nanomycelis exosomes biomedical applications and drug delivery targeted therapy molecular imaging gene delivery molecular marker identification disease diagnosis and uh, drug delivery in organs also in uh, organs we use some targeted nanoparticle things so this is a portion for uh, synthesis nanoparticles and its characterization. If you have any doubt in this portion, you can ask your question in chat box, and I'll clear one by one. Till now, if you have any doubt, anyone? If you cannot unmute your mic, so you can drop your message in chat box. So it means there's no question in this session. So far it's clear. Okay, Vijay. So only Vijay is responding to all the things. And other also should respond now. Okay, let's start with the next presentation then. The next second week. So the next is DNA nanotechnology. If you have any questions, if you are feeling shy or not unmute your mic, you can just drop your questions in chat box. I'm asking once again. Just uh, I'm giving you two minutes time. If you have any doubts, any queries, you can drop your questions in chat box. If you some students feel shy to unmute their mic and ask their question, then no worries. You can take your time. You can write your question in chat box. I'll wait for two minutes. Then we'll proceed. So the next topic is DNA nanotechnology. So here, welcome to the world of DNA nanotechnology. Here we explore the fascinating potential of DNA molecules as building blocks for advanced structures and devices. So this DNA is also known as nucleic acid nanotechnology. This DNA nanotechnology is called as nucleic acid nanotechnology. So it is a fusion of nanotechnology plus biotechnology. 
so the design and fabrication of artificial nucleation structures for technical application so dna is the carrier for genetic information as you all know but here here used as a structural components also so we'll get to know about some dna information what dna is so dna is a polymer of deoxy ribonucleic nucleotide so dna is found in chromosomes mitochondria and chloroplast so it carries the genetic informations in two forms nucleotides and nucleosides so the nucleotide is composed of sugar base and phosphates but nucleosides is only of sugar and base there is no phosphate in this so as you can see in this uh, structural things phosphate sugar and base are there so this sugar and base this two structures compose composition is called as nucleoside an entire tree with phosphate is called a nucleotide so dna and rna both have five carbon sugar as you all know which is known as pentose then dna contains two deoxy ribose then rna contains only d ribose so the pyrimidines cytosine thymines and uracil in, and purines consists of adenine and guanine then why dna is used for nanotechnology so it is relatively stable chemical we can consider dna as a chemical here so it is a chemical by the way deoxy ribonucleotide so it is a stable chemical which exists in different forms such as nucleotides nucleic acid as a polymer it can form very long molecules it has well defined repetitive structures rules for determining the structures are simple and well understood within the molecule many atoms are available to form useful interactions or modification and dna is a biocompatible material so that is why we are using dna as a structural material for developing various nanostructures here so why dna is for nanotechnology let's proceed this so dna have some capacity some major factors like information storage self assembly of dna then precision of dna so dna can store vast amount of information in a compact form its four letter code a atgc as you have i have uh, told earlier so which can code digital data making its potential candidate for high density data storage so this atgc is used as a memory card or a ram or a rom you can say of any computer likewise the dna or this atgc is used as memory card here so then self assembly so dna molecules have a natural tendency to self assemble into specific structures driven by the complementary base pairing between nucleotides this property allows scientists to design and program dna to fold into precise shapes and structures which is crucial for nanoscale format construction then the next one is precision dna based nanotechnology allows for nanoscale precision researchers can design dna sequences to create specific structures and patterns enabling the constructions of custom made nanoscale objects and devices with a high accuracy then the biocompatibility dna is a biocompatible material meaning it is generally well tolerated by biological systems some of the materials are not biocompatible with the human body or any uh, synthetic material so this biocompatibility of dna is a major factor this is why we can use this dna in nanotechnology nowadays so this property makes it suitable for use in medical applications such as drug delivery systems or targeted therapy functionalization and dna can be modified with various functional groups and molecules enabling the attachment of their other nanoparticles molecules or sensors this functionalization expands the range of applications for dna based nanotechnology then the next one is selective binding the dna molecules can be engineered to recognize and bind to specific target molecules with high selectivity making them as use, useful for biosensor diagnostics and molecular recognition application the next major factor is its scalability dna based nanotechnology is highly scalable allowing for the production of a large number of identical nanostructures with the relatively low cost and low efforts then the last is biomimicry dna based structures can mimic biological processes and structures for example dna origami can be used to create nanoscale containers or carriers for drug delivery mirroring some aspects of natural viruses of cellular structures then dna nanotechnology is a field that utilizes unique properties of dna molecules to construct nanostructures with precision and control like in the last uh, in the last uh, slides 
still told that someone has been moved out. Scalability exactly perfect. So scalability means uh, mass production. Some of the things cannot be produced in the mass scale. So this scalability is about the mass production of the DNA structures molecule. I have told you not highly scalable, allowing the production of a large number of identical nanostructures with relatively low cost and efforts. So, this DNA based nanomaterials, nanotechnology, or nanoparticles can be made in a large volume. The scalability means is volume here, as we can relate. As we can see in some research institute, they produce some of the less quantity structures are there, but in industries, they used to prepare in a large scale. So this scalability is considered as a volume of any material here. Hmm. So DNA used as a structural material rather than as a carrier for of biological information to make structures as a DNA origami method. DNA origami is a technique that uses a long single stranded DNA scaffold and short staple stranded to fold DNA into predetermined shapes. So this method enables the creation of 2D and 3D structures with a remarkable precision. So this is some example of DNA origami. DNA origami basically means to design that particular things in different shapes and different structures to use in biological systems. So the images on top are the computer produced folding sequences of the DNA strand and the bottom row is the atomic force microscope image of the different DNA origami shapes. So now we will ask that why to design or why to alter this DNA in different shapes. It depends on the productivity, it depends on the targeting sites, it depends on our aims and objectives. Depending on the aims and objectives of our study, of our research, then we'll alter this DNA into different structures. Likewise, we used to uh, alter the single A4 sheet into, into different shapes, like we used to make boats, we used to make aeroplanes for that single sheets with due to its various applications. If you want, if you want, uh, that particular A4 sheet to float in water. Then we'll go for the formation of boat with a single A4 sheet. If you want to fly that A4 sheet in air, then we used to make that A4 sheet into aeroplane shape. Likewise here also, based on the application, the structures could be altered into different shapes. So it has been shown that different shapes can elect different biological effects. The triangular shaped origami provided the best accumulation at the best cancer tumor site as compared to the square and tube shaped origami as i told you know uh, so they have made the triangular shaped ori dna origami to target breast cancer tumor breast tumor breast cancer tumor cells must have something triangular binding shape targeting sites must be there that's why they have uh, altered that dna origami in triangular shape and uh, used as a targeting binding sites on uh, breast cancer cells so that's why they have prepared the DNA origami in triangular shape. As you can see the example here. So this is a triangle, triangular DNA origami. Then they have conjugated that DNA origami with DOX, DOX. DOX is called as doxorubicin here. Doxorubicin is a drug, anti-cancer drug. Then DOX and DNA origami is conjugated. Then it is released in partially digested do doxorubicin in DNA after targeting to the uh, breast cancer cells. Then we'll proceed for the DNA nanostructures. So basic geometric and thermodynamics properties of DNA are well known and predictable by available softwares like Tilesoft and GenoCAD. So uh, DNA ladders like structures provides the key framework to the scientists. Existence of commercially available modifying enzymes are there in uh, nanotechnology fields. And persistent length of DNA is about 500 angstrom. Then self-assembly properties of DNA is easy to construct the variety of structures in predictable manner. So this DNA origami is called as self-assembly properties of DNA. Due to this self-assembly property, we can alter the structures and physical structure or physical you know, nature of that particular DNA due to the self-assembly nature. Then assembled structures can be characterized by various techniques like AFM, TEM and cryo, cryo electron microscope as we have discussed in the nanoparticles things AFM, TEM, and cryotem. Cryotem is nothing. This is a ultra microtomy of that particular thing. 
then the dna nanotechnology application so there are two way i have divided this dna nanotechnology in two uh, different classes self assembled dna structures and inorganic nanomaterials then the self assembled dna structures could be dna origami dna hydrogel single amplifications deoxyribozymes and in inorganic materials use gold nanomaterials with the dna two dimensional nano sheets fluorescent nanomaterials and magnetic nanoparticles with dna then the application of dna nanotechnology so dna is the best nanowire in existence because it can self assemble uh, as i uh, as we have discussed in the dna origami things then self replicate then it adopts various states and conformation in rapid disease detection using the dna nanotubes and molecular treatment is very easy nowadays we have used in theranostics nowadays as uh, dna as a nanotechnology then dna robotics wide range of uh, uses ranging from building blocks robotics then dna nanochips used in the making much smaller microchips than the current semiconductor fabrication technology so then dna computers dna can be used to make computers instead of silicon based on dna stem loop controllers so as you have heard somewhere like uh, chips computer chips are made up of silicon silicon is the best conductor conductor types of things but nowadays scientists have used this dna as a conducting things in computers so one example is there uh, maya 2 if we'll google this maya 2 na the entire chip system is based on dna so they have used dna instead of silicon to make this silicon based circuits in that computer so replacing normal silicon based circuits this chip has dna strands to form the circuit example maya 2 and then dna walkers dna nanotechnology can be used to create walking bipedal nano robots this is bipedal so then dna nanotechnology represents a ground breaking approach to nano scale engineering its ability to create custom designed structures and functional devices has the potential to revolutionize various structures various industries and structures so this is all about the dna nanotechnology if you have any doubt you can unmute your mic ask if you cannot unmute your mic you can uh, drop your question in chat box take your time just take your time just for 2 minutes so uh, let me just take one water break for 2 minutes i'll be back after Comments. If you have any doubts, any queries, just keep it quick. Then we'll discuss. Okay. So I'll be back.
हाँ जी सो क्वेश्चन आर वट इज द करंट स्टेट ऑफ दिस नैनो रोबोट नैनो बॉट विल देर बी एनी प्रॉब्लम इन द फ्यूचर नैनो बॉट कैन बी यूज So basically, these nanobots are used as a carrier for any material. So if we use as any nano particle, we'll explain about chances of modified hemoglobin neutralized hemoglobin. Okay, we'll uh, come to that also. The two spending sessions, and then we'll cover this, uh, this doubt also. So how to sense the DNA or the gamete? Nucleotides are added to a particular system. How is the shape of the or the gamete is fixed there? There are different synthesis procedures are there. If you want to uh, modify that in triangular shape, proper uh, procedure is there. Wait, wait. Hmm. So there are basic, uh, basically different procedures are there for particular shapes. So if you want to uh, modify that particular DNA in different shapes, spherical. Cubical, triangular, different procedures are there. Let me share that article if you want to go through in deep. You can go through that uh, particular article and you get to know how to that particular DNA or gametes base is prepared and synthesized into particular shapes. Then we will explain about the synthesis of modified. That will cover it last. And topic is this. Hmm. So let me share my presentation. Hmm. So the next topic is nano materials for cancer diagnosis and its therapy. So first we will discuss about cancer. What is cancer? So welcome to the presentation on nano materials for cancer diagnosis and therapy. So cancer is a global health challenge. and innovative approaches are needed for early diagnosis and effective therapy so cancer is a group of diseases characterized by the uncontrolled growth and spread and of spread of abnormal cells in the body it can affect any tissue or organ it may result in the formation of a tumor so basically what is cancer cancer have you heard about mutation of genes mutation of cells certain changes in the gene can lead to the cancers abnormal growth of any particular cell will lead to cancer so basically the mutation thing is there mutation in anything will lead to the cancer so these growths are considered either benign or malignant each type of cancer is unique with its own causes symptoms and methods of treatment not all tumors are cancers benign tumors do not spread to the other parts of the body there are two types of that what is benign and what is malignant so this benign tumors are do not spread to the other parts of the body meanwhile malignant can spread into other parts of the body then the can causes of cancer so any agent that cause cancer is called as a carcinogen and is described as a carcinogenic material or a carcinogenic agent so genetic factors also some of the reasons could be there like inherited gene mutations can increase of the risk of cancer these uh, mutations is the term which i have used that that time so the lifestyle choices also so tobacco use an healthy diet lack of physical activity and excessive alcohol consumption some of the factors are environmental also like exposure to the carcinogens such as radiation and certain chemicals like some of the occupations are there in which they use in research also like scientists also have to exposure a lot of chemicals a lot of carcinogenic agents so this are the things could be considered as a cause of cancers so cancer development so there are three step stages are there in the cancer development the first one is initiation promotion and progression so in initiation genetic mutations or changes in cellular dna is there then promotion is the uncontrolled cell growth then progression progression invasion into nearby tissues and potential metastasis spread to the distant organs so as you can see in this figure so the normal cells is there will leads to some genetic changes or mutations then will divide that cell and doubling of that cancer cells will lead to the malignant tumor like uncontrolled growth 
growth of an of that particular cell. This is the example in liver. As you can see the cancer cell divisions and will lead to malignant tumor then. See how a normal cells can transform into cancer cells. Then the types of cancer. There are over 100 different known cancers that affect humans, but most common ones are breast cancer, brain cancer, lung cancer, colon cancer, and prostate cancer. Then the stages of cancer, which I have told earlier. So the cancer are localized to one part of the body, which are usually curable, will come in stage one. If you have noticed, the doctors told to the patient that this is a stage one cancer, this is a stage four cancer, stage two or three. So what does it mean? So if cancer is it localized to one part of the body, which that will be called as a stage one cancer, and which can be curative. Then stage two and stage three are cancers are locally advanced. Then stage four, stage four are of have oftenly metastasized or spread to the organs or throughout the body. So as you can see the example in this figure. So cells with genetic mutation is a single cell is there. This is a green one considered as a cancer cell. The hyperplasia of that cancer cell will be worked and dysplasia in to cancer and invasive cancer of that part in that particular organ will lead to the cancers. Then we have an example of stages of breast cancer. So we'll discuss then. So breast cancer have four stages. At zero stage, abnormal cells are present but have not spread to the nearby tissues. Then early stage, in early stage cancer has spread to the other tissues in small area. Then localized, in localized stage, tumor is in between 20 to 15 mm and some lymph nodes are involved or a tumor larger than 50 mm with no lymph nodes involved. Then the regional spread is in tumor in, is large than 50 mm with more lymph nodes involved across a wider region. In some cases, there is no tumor present at all. Cancer may have spread to the skin or chest wall. Then in the last stage, stage 4, cancer has spread beyond the breast to the other parts of the body. Then nanotechnology in the detection of diagnosis of the cancer. So nanomaterials offer promising solutions due to their unique properties and versatility. Then nanotechnology can be used for better cancer diagnosis. One of the main usage, usage fields of optical nanoparticles is allow better cancer detection. This optical nanoparticles are the nanoparticles which have some fluorescent property. And nowadays, which uh, what we do in labs now, that we tag our particular nanoparticles with some fluorescent dye or some fluorescent nano fluorescent material. Likewise, one example is there. Let me tell you, DID dye. One dye is there called DID dye. We tag that or nanoparticle or treatment with that particular dye. The dye is targeted to that particular cancer cell or tumor cells. So uh, when we dye, when we tag our dye to the nanoparticles, it will target to that particular tumor cell and it will show and diagnosis and detect that particular tumor cells that this tumor cell is present at this particular area or particular organ. So this optical nanoparticles is a particles which which uh, which have fluorescent properties in it. Some magnesium chloride are also there. Gold have also uh, fluorescent property in it. So these are the things which can be used as the optical nanoparticles. Then classical methods that are used ion diagnosis have limitations such as X-ray, tomography, or mammography. Require using mutagenic agents on cells that cause cancer too. Then to eliminate these concerns, optical nanoparticles and diagnosis is possible technique that can be used. So this technique works with special dyes to interact with tumor cells and optical nanoparticles can be detected. See, I have told now. So special dyes are used to interact with tumor cells and optical nanoparticles can be detected. So these dyes are DID dye or propidium iodide, magnesium chloride dye. Then a lot of dyes are there. Sometimes we tag our nanoparticle to gold nanoparticles. Gold have some uh, auto fluorescent properties in it so that's why gold is also used as a fluorescent material sometimes so then comparison of traditional and nano based methods of cancer treatment so suppose we have cancer some of the patients have cancer then we have to treat it with that conventional system and with the nano based method so in less so in conventional uh, or traditional treatment 
the still surface area poor targeting capabilities poor bioavailability ability of that particular drug to that partially killing of the cancer cells so as you can see the color things the color density in the par, in the traditional anti cancer treatment so cancer cells are partially killed not completely but in the nano enabled anti cancer treatment there is high surface area of that nano particles better targeting capabilities better bioavailability of that particular uh, nano material reaching to the tumor cells so leading to this profound profound killing of cancer cells are there so you, you can see the difference how the different color density is there so the next is applications applications of the diagnosis in therapy so some of the nanoparticles can be used as diagnosis to quantum dots nano shield and gold nanoparticle so as you can see some of the nanoparticles are used as diagnosis and some of the nanoparticles are used for a treatment how it could be possible so uh, in diagnosis there is one term we call theranostics in theranostics means diagnosis and treatment in a single thing in a single uh, carrier so uh, diagnosis uh, consists of quantum dots nano sh nano shells gold nano particles and therapy consists of liposomes carbon nanotubes polymeric micelles and trimers quantum dots here we can take one example like we'll uh, conjugate this gold nano particle with dendrimer or quantum dots or carbon nanotubes so first uh, whenever we'll administer that particular nano particle in the system the gold nano particle will diagnose that tumor cells and this carbon nanotube will treat that uh, cancer cells at a single time so this will be called as a nano diagnostics so the diagnosis uh, in diagnosis near infrared quantum dots we cover one by one so the lack of ability to penetrate objects limits the use of visible spectral imaging quantum dots that uh, emits fluorescence in the near infrared spectrum have been designed to overcome this problem making them more suitable for imaging colorectal cancer liver cancer pancreatic cancer and lymphoma then nano shells another commonly used nanotechnology applications is the use of nano shells nano shells are dielectric cores between 10 to 300 nanometers in size usually made of silicon and coated with the thin metal shell these nano shells work by converting plasma mediated electrical energy into light energy that can be flexibly toned optically through uv infrared emission absorption or arrays then nano shells are desirable because their imaging is devoid of the heavy metal toxicity even though their uses are limited by their larger sizes nano shells are a bit larger than a nano particle that's why they desirably used then the third is colloidal gold nano particles gold nano particles is a good contrast agent because it's of its small size good biocompatibility and high atomic number so research shows that gold nano particles work by both active and passive ways to target cells the principle of passive targeting is governed by a gathering of gold nano particles to enhance imaging because of permeability tensions affecting tumor cells on the other hand the active targeting is mediated by the coupling of gold nano particles with tumor specific targeted drugs such as egfr monoclonal antibodies to achieve gold nano particles active targeting of the tumor cells so here we have an example of gold nano particles in a passive and active treatment so as you can see in the passive think some osmotic tension effect are there and some cancer cells are more than this active things and in active thing cancer cells are as much as in the healthy cells this kind of things are used also when you can see the shapes of nano particles gold nano particles gold nano particles are of different shapes spherical star shapes uh, rods are also there so these are the major difference of uh, colloidal gold nano particles then some of the examples of nano particles in applications so the gold nano particles should be in or must be in uh, spherical shape rod shells labeled spheres spheres stars and uh, primarily spheres so various shapes of gold nano particles will be loaded into tissue containing cancer cells then it will lead to the imaging of that as you can see in the middle one tissue containing cancer cells only 
pink or red colors of cancer cells are there and after loading that cancer cells with gold nanoparticles so it will give a fluorescent like yellow and blue so it is fluorescent and covering that tumor cells with nanoparticle and showing op an optical imaging of that particular cancer cells uh, confirms confirming the tumor cells are present at the particular organ or particular organ sites then the application of nanoparticles in cancer diagnosis so we have nanoparticles like carbon based nanoparticles ceramic nanoparticles metal nanoparticles and polymer nanoparticles with applications in cancer diagnosis and detection battery drug delivery and cancer imaging the detection and imaging of cancer cells and tissue and drug delivery and diagnosis this is their properties and example of cancer diagnosis so uh, let me uh, explain this example of cancer diagnosis so both in vivo and in vitro studies shows that nano droplets are an effective contrast material for both photoacoustic and ultrasound imaging we usually in carbon based nanoparticles this property is there then clean for ceramic nanoparticles the clinical studies of gold nano shell based photothermal photothermal therapy are under consideration for ablating repetitive head and neck tumors as well as cancer imaging and in metallic nanoparticles gold nanoparticles for raman imaging usually must be done then polymeric nanoparticles some block co polymer coated nanoparticles connected with rgd peptides and dye molecules to target that particular tumor so the next is therapy by using nanomaterials so in liposomes as you can see liposome can use as a vaccine therapy photodynamic therapy drug delivery diagnosis and liposomes is a composed of hydrophilic core for water and hydrophilic drug and the lipidic layer for lipophilic drug and the hydrophilic head which protect the entire liposome from uh, fatty materials so the next the properties of liposomes liposomes are one of the most studied nanomaterials which are nano scale spheres composed of natural or synthesis phospholipid bilayer membrane and water based nuclei because of the amphiphilicity of phospholipids liposomes form spontaneously allowing hydrophilic ones from before the multilayer liposomes then the, under the influence of epr effect the vesicle of size around 4000 kilo dalton to 500 nanometer can be allowed into the tumor by the gaps in a vessel then in tumors they can be fused with cells are internalized by endocytosis and release drugs in the intracellular space then the liposome up to 100 nanometers easily penetrate the tumor and stay longer while the half life of the bigger liposome is shorter because they are easily recognized and cleared up by the mononuclear phagocyte system so in liposomes now uh, which uh, the liposomes up to 100 nanometers can easily penetrate the tumor cells or cancer cells and that liposomes can stay up to longer in that cancer cells during their treatment and as the liposomes have the uh, half life of the liposomes is very bigger so the shorter because they are easily recognized and cleared by the mononuclear phagocyte system so after the treatment the mononuclear phagocyte system is there which can clearly easily uh, recognize and clear that liposome uh, present in the particular system or organ so the liposome bound antibodies target tumor specific antigens to ensure active targeting and then transport drugs to the tumor with a lot of pharmacokinetic benefits some liposome drugs liposomal drugs are approved for clinical therapy also so for instance liposome forms and adrenomycin adrenomycin uh, have been used for the management of metastatic ovarian cancer where they have shown appreciable clinical benefits of the particular liposomes then we have some uh, applications and some case studies of liposomes this liposomes have been conjugated with particular drugs as you can see doxorubicin paclitaxel mitomycin citrabine curcumin and lipovaccin a lot of drugs can be conjugated with liposome to target to treat different ki kind of tumors or cancer like for uh, example platinum like sensitive ovarian cancer advanced solid tumors acute lyme lymphoma Shahar Khan, your mic is on mute. Kindly my mute your mic. Shahar Khan.
there if you have any doubt you can uh, drop your message in chat box So we are discussing about the applications, uh, some case studies of liposome with drugs to treat the particular uh, cancer tumors. So cancer tumors like uh, locally advanced metastatic cancer, malignant melanoma, and known small cancer cells, cancer uh, tumor cells. And these are some findings or benefits of that uh, use of liposome in that particular cancer cell. I'll share this PPT. You can go with the brief after this session. Then uh, the next is carbon nanotubes. Carbon nanotubes are made up of single wall carbon. They are excellent material and have many useful applications due to their electrical and thermal conductivity, durability and lightweight properties of that particular carbon nanotube. So as you can see here is one example, carbon nanotube is conjugated with anti-cancer drug conjugation then functionalization. So this anti-cancer drug conjugation will lead to the drug delivery in cancer tissue. On the other hand, functionalization will lead to the cancer tissue imaging. So this carbon nanotube is also working as a theranostics at a single time. It will uh, tell them cancer, uh, the imaging of cancer tissue. Then after followed by the drug delivery in cancer tissue will treat the particular tumor cells. Because of the physical and uh, chemical properties of carbon nanotubes that include surface area, mechanical strength, metal properties, electrical and thermal conductivity, it is a candidate well suited for large scale biomedical applications. Carbon nanotubes also possesses a property that allows them to absorb light from the infrared region, causing the nanotubes to heat up by the thermal effect, hence can target the tumor cells. The natural forms of carbon nanotubes promote non-invasive penetration of biofilms and are regarded as a highly competent carriers for the transport of various drug molecules into living cells. So due to the uh, suitability of carbon nanotubes, Drugs such as paclitaxel are assembled with them and are administered both in vitro and in vivo for the cancer treatment. Then the polymeric micelles. Polymeric nanoparticles are the inventions that relate to a solid micelles with the particle size ranging from 100 to 10 to 1000 nanometers. And the polymeric nanoparticles are collectively known as polymer nanoparticles, nanospheres, nanocapsules, or polymer micelles. And they have were the first polymers reported for the drug delivery system so far. Then the polymeric nanoparticles serves as a drug carrier for hydrophobic drugs and are widely used for the drug system nowadays. The polymeric nanoparticles constructed from amphophilic polymers with a hydrophilic or hydrophobic block which can perform rapid assembly because of the hydrophobic interactions in an aqueous solution. Then the polymeric nanoparticles can capture the hydrophobic drugs because of a covalent bond or the interaction by a hydrophobic pore. So thus to carry the hydrophilic charged molecules such as proteins, peptides and nucleic acids, these blocks are switched to allow interactions in the core and neutralize the charge. Then recently the polymeric nanoparticles have been used widely in the nanotechnology based cancer drug design due to their excellent potential benefits for patient care. For example, we have adriamycin, which we have discussed all earlier also. Conjugated nanomaterials was used to treat several types of cancers, which has achieved therapeutic effects to a decent degree. So here is some case studies or some research cases are there, like polymeric micelles have been conjugated with different kind of drugs, like apirubicin, genoxol, PM+, carboplatin, and paclitaxel, which will lead to the cure of uh, cancer like solid tumors, ovarian cancer, and breast cancer. Some of the findings from this polymeric nanoparticles by the conjugation of uh, any drug will lead to the well tolerated in patients with various solid tumors and exhibited less toxicity than conventional epirubicin formulation. And in a case of ovarian cancer, non inferior efficacy and well tolerated toxicity were there. Uh, on the other hand, in breast cancer and paclitaxel with polymeric micelles, this had a better toxicity profile than paclitaxel thing. Then the next thing is dendrimer. Dendrimer are highly defined artificial macromolecules with a 3D network that have a high number of functional groups. Dendrimers have three layers like molecular core, the inner layer and the outer layer. 
in addition they have solubility viscosity and micellar properties due to their structures they have multifunctional abilities making them useful for building next generation nano devices for imaging and diagnosis of particular cancer cells human cells then uh, the dendrimers are synthesized in two uh, in two forms one is divergent and the another one is convergent synthesis so there are usually two ways to synthesize dendrimers a divergent method in which the dendrimers can grow outward from the central nucleus and a convergence method where the dendrimers grow inward from the edges and end in the structure in the central nucleus as you can see in the structure so in the, this is the divergent method of the dendrimer synthesis and this uh, the dendrimer will growing outward from the central nucleus so this is the blue one is central nucleus it is going outward from the central nucleus and a convergence method where the dendrimer go inward in inward and end up in the central nucleus as you can see this is a uh, dendrimer things and this is an ending up with the central nuclei so both are uh, running in the opposite directions one is uh, outward from the central nucleus and and the another is inward from the edges or and ending up in the central nucleus the uh, physical chemical and biological properties of the polymer including the size charge multi ligand groups lipid bilayer interactions cytotoxicity internalization plasma retention time biological distribution and filtration of dendritic macromolecules have made up dendritic potential nanoscale carriers nowadays so the next is the schematic uh, structures of how dendrimer is being conjugated with anti cancer drug so after conjugating any anti cancer drug with dendrimer it will go through two principles one is called encapsulation and one is called complexation in encapsulation as you can see the drugs are uh, stored in in between the dendrimers encapsulated anti cancer drug so uh, the anti cancer drug is stored nearby the central core on the other hand in complexation the anti cancer drug linkage with dendrimeric surfaces is attached in complexation the particular cancer drug molecules is attached with the dendrimer dendrimeric surface so these are the two principles by which the dendrimer releases its drug from the base so the applications of dendrimers in cancer detection and cancer diagnosis so here we have some applications and complex of dendrimer so here dendrimer generation in breast cancer treatment with the cell cycle analysis then which can lead to uh, to the carrier delivery in breast cancer therapy so likewise another examples are also there so the next is quantum dot quantum dots are semiconductor particles with a typical di diameter of 2 to 10 nanometer they are so named because due to their nano scale size quantum effects plays a significant part in their light emitting properties the mechanism of light emission of quantum dots is under external stimulus some of the electrons of the dot material absorb sufficient energy to escape their atomic orbit so this creates a conductance a region in which the electrons can move through the material effectively conducting electricity as these electrons drop back into atomic orbit so in this way the energy is released in the form of light the color of which depends on the amount of energy released so quantum dots can uh, emit a lot of different kind of colors and it which depends on the how much energy it is releasing from the quantum dot so this is the structure of quantum dots which is consists of a quantum dot core its shell and its protective shells the outer layer is the protective shell of the quantum, particular quantum dot so uh, this is a property sometimes quantum confinement we can say as you can see in structure quantum dots are of different color so because of the dots small size the amount of energy released is relatively consistent from electron to electron yielding emissions of a single color so as you can see there are some different colors of the quantum dots are here some of blue some purple green yellow and red so this color is entirely dependent upon the size of the dot see uh, color differentiation is basis uh, is depend on the how bigger or how small the quantum dot size is so the uh, with larger dots providing lower energy emissions and the smaller quantum dots providing higher energy emissions 
like blues and violet then in uh, cancer diagnosis quantum dots immunostaining is a potential tool for the detection of various tumor biomarkers such as the cell protein or other components of a heterogeneous tumor cell samples then quantum dots can gather in specific parts of the body and transfer the drug to those parts the ability of the quantum dots to concentrate in single internal organs makes them a potential solution against untargeted drug delivery and possibly avoid the side effects of the chemotherapy then the latest advancement in the surface modification of quantum dot which combine with biomolecules including peptides and antibodies in vivo and can be used to target tumors and make possible their potential applications in cancer imaging and treatment and some studies combines quantum dots with posted specific antigen to label cancer while other use quantum dots to make biomarkers that speed up the process which such immune markers having a more stable light intensity than traditional fluorescent immune markers wait ah so this is uh, up to the quantum uh, dots so uh, before starting next topic let me just share the links with you guys where you can find this presentation and topics and the recorded session of this let me stop for a while and share the link so i have shared uh, the youtube channel link with you guys so here i have uploaded all the recorded session of the last previous session so you can access all the videos
after this session i'll uh, share it on my google chat Yes, need to raise your hand. Turn it out. So I've shared you uh, two links with you. One is of YouTube channel and one is of Google Drive link. So on YouTube channel, you'll uh, find all the last recorded session, and on Google Drive link, you'll uh, find the PPTs which I've presented in the last previous session. So let's proceed with the next topic. This topic called the pharmacology. So the next topic is nanopharmacology drug targeting and nanoplastic polymer. So uh, as my screen is visible now and is going time by time, uh, let me know. My screen is changing now. So the nanopharmacology is the use of nanotechnology for the discovery of new pharmacological molecular entities, selection of pharmaceutical for specific individuals to maximize effectiveness and minimize side effects, and delivery of pharmaceuticals to targeted locations or tissues within the body. So basically nanopharmacology is the branch of pharmacology which is gradually merging with the applications of nanoscience and nanotechnology in the field of nanomedicine. So drug design and drug delivery to selected targets to improve pharmacodynamics and kinetic profiles towards safer and effective treatment is known as pharm nanopharmacology. So the next. So the nanotechnology in pharmacology field. Why do we use this nanotechnology in pharmacology? So due to its some applications and factors like drug acquisition, drug storage and dispensing, safety and carrier giver, its access, its defective nanodrug applications, its decay over time, its predictability and its unknown interactions, human environment, animal transmission, a lot of factors are there due to which we use nanotechnology and nanopharmacology. So in nanopharmacology, there are two terms. When you go through some nanopharmacology uh, thing, you will find two basic terms. The one is the pharmacokinetics and the second one is pharmacodynamics. So the pharmacokinetics is what the body does to the drug while the pharmacodynamics is what the drug does to the body. So in pharmacokinetics we'll uh, go through some terms called ad absorption, distribution, metabolism and excretion of drug. Meanwhile in pharmacodynamics is only the activity of the drug which is the how drug is acting in the body. So we'll discuss these two things in uh, detail now. So the nanomedicines which I told earlier, those who have not attended the last sessions, that we have put the slide there. That the nanomedicines are of different types, which we have covered today. So we are not going to discuss this. So the field of nanopharmacology can be classified into distinct categories. 
like defining targets, development of drugs in carrier systems, studying target drug interactions, monitoring the target drug interactions outcomes. Uh, so, uh, in defining targets, so have you ever heard that uh, binding sites? So one is targeting and one is binding site. So we have some drugs. We have to prepare some drugs in some particular shapes that will go and target to the specific and particular binding sites. So here we have some macromolecular target with unbound drugs. So this drug will come and will attach and will target to this particular binding site. And the macromolecular town, uh, mac macromolecular target with the bomb particular bonding sites will attach here. And uh, this attachment is composed of different groups such as binding regions, binding groups and intermolecular bonds. So the bonds form between the target and the drug is called intermolecular drug, intermolecular bond between the drug and the particular binding site. So this also we have discussed uh, in the last session. So we're not going to discuss this. This is the different types of active targeting, covalent conjugation, and different types of nanoparticles. So the development of drugs in carrier systems. So here we have an example of the human serum albumin. So here some uh, this uh, the white color, this cremish color is the human serum albumin. They will target our drug and peptide with the human serum albumin that will uh, conjugate with the drug HSA. Then we will particularly go to the antibody binding complexes and it looks like this drug HSA nanoparticles by viewing it in uh, some electron microscopy. Then the uh, target drug infections. So in uh, homokinetic infections, as I've told, there are four terms, ADME. Absorp absorption of drug, distribution of drug, metabolism or biotransformation of drug, and excretion of drug. Meanwhile, in pharmacodynamics interactions, they are called receptive interaction, receptor sensitivity, and drug transportation. So here, usually the binding sites of macromolecules are more hydrophobic in nature than the surface. And so this enhances the effect of an ionic interaction. So the drop of an ionic bonding strength with separation is less than in other intermolecular interactions. So if an ionic interaction is possible, it is likely to be the most important initial interaction or as a drug enters the mining site. So as you can see, uh, some drug is uh, conjugated with some, uh, uh, you know, you can say uh, compound or any functional group. Then will the target is attached with some different functional group. So this will interact the positive one and negative one will interact with each other and will target and will conjugate with each other. Then we uh, attack the targeting sites and release a particular drug or particular active pharmaceutical ingredient, whatever the carrier have and release all the active pharmaceutical ingredient at that particular binding site. So the next thing is quantitative system pharmacology. So here we have some two indication types, horizontal indication and vertical indication. So as you can see, uh, there are some goals of quantitative system pharmacology on a systematic holistic understanding of drug interactions. Then they have some chemistry, biological systems, and pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamics, pharmacogenomics, with a lot of factors uh, called population, patients, animals, organs, cells, and derived components. Meanwhile, in horizontal integration, the uh, uh, factors called target targets in cells, cellular networks, and multicellular networks. Then uh, the monitoring the target drug interactions outcomes are loss of the therapeutic effect, toxicity, unexpected increase in the pharmacological activity, is beneficial effects, chemical or physical interactions like incompatibility in fluids or syringes mixture. Then the, what is the nanopharmacology targets? So the nanopharmacology targets to slow release nanopharmacology, control release nanopharmacology, to close the biobarrier penetration nanopharmacology. So we'll cover one by one now. So the slow release nanopharmacology is a slow release of nanopharmacology study. The question on how to re re realize the slow release and the influences of slow release of the drug metabolism and the therapeutic effects. So here we have uh, two things, but one is non-stabilized and one is stabilized. So the next is uh, controlled uh, release nanopharmacology. So here we have uh, three terms like uh, cell sort 
affecting dynamic uh, migrations morphogen gradients induce aggregations adhesive scaffolds and controlled delivery the controlled delivery from nanopharmacology studies how to realize the smart trees of the drug according to the therapeutic needs in cellular and tissue micro environment so in cell sorting as you can see it is composed of cell assembly you can the cells of cancer cells are of an random motions then it will leads to the controlled release and homology and will sort all the cells in a particular manner then in the directed uh, migrations they have some neural tubes and neural crest cells are there and will not uh, affect the neural tubes uh, till the neural crest cells appears then likewise some different aggregations are there like adhesive scaffolds control releases are there then bio barrier penetration and homology bio barrier penetration and homology studies the capabilities of nano drugs to passing through the bio barriers blood brain barriers and air air blood barriers also to realize the treatment of some focal diseases where the additional drugs can't arrive because their incapability to penetrate the bio barrier so the next topic of concern is nano toxicology so nano toxicology is a branch of bio nano science which deals with the study and application of toxicity of nano materials uh, suppose we have taken any nano material or nano particles which will uh, cause nano toxic uh, toxicology if it is given in some maximum concentration so uh, likewise nano toxicological studies are intended to determine at what extent their properties may pose a threat to the environment and the human beings and to other organs of the human body so the size of of a particle decreases its surface area increases and also allows the greater properties of its atoms or molecules to be displayed on the surface rather than the interior of the material so the change in the physical chemical and structural properties of engineered nanomaterials with a decrease in the size would be responsible for a number of materials interaction that could lead to the toxicological effect so the next is some properties of nanotoxicology which consists of surface area its morphology chemical composition of that particular nano particles of nano material size of nano particles surface charge of nano material and solubility that how much soluble that particular api with particular carrier so the toxicity of nano materials were broadly classified into two categories one is biological toxicity the another one is environmental toxicity the biological toxicity uh, the nano structures can enter the body via six principal routes iv dermal subcutaneous inhalation ip or oral the entered nano structures can distribute to various organs in the body and may remain same structurally be modified or be metabolized they enter the cells of the organ and residue in the cells for an unknown amount of time before leaving to the move to the other organs to be excreted so the toxicity effects are um, allergy fibrosis inflammation dna damage tissue damage cytotoxicity deposition in different organs lead to organ failure so the next one is environmental toxicity during the outburst of the nanomaterial discharge these uh, there comes a lot of nanoparticles to the environment so nanoparticles pollution by deposition of nanoparticles in ground water and soil so the process that control transport and removal of nanoparticles in water and waste water are yet to be investigated studies of on studies on the effect of nanoparticles on plants and microbes are also rare in environmental toxicity so the uh, other nanomaterial exposures are occupational exposure consumer exposure uh, in occupational exposure suppose person involved in nanomaterial manufacturing and research With the increasing demand of nanomaterials in market, the exposure of workers making these materials and using nanoparticles in the manufacturing plant is also increasing. Suppose in uh, I'll give you an example of occupational exposure. Suppose some uh, researcher or scientist is working with some carcinogenic material throughout his life, like throughout his 20 to 25 years. It may cause of occupational exposure toxicity to that particular researcher or particular scientist. so the consumer exposure engineered nanoparticles are used in personal care products ranging from cosmetics to sunscreens where decreasing the size active ingredient yields in better performance so in occupational exposure i have discussed about the researcher or scientists which are getting uh, 
starts with the carcinogen or any particular toxicity material while uh, any uh, consumer any student or any person which is using nanomaterials on a daily basis like was in cosmetic they this can also lead to some nanotoxicity of that particular material to the uh, consumer so uh, the uh, example of environmental exposure the engineered nanomaterial applications developed as a projected the increasing concentrations of nanomaterials in underground water and soil may present the most significant exposure when used for assessing environmental risk so suppose any uh, research inst institute research industry is there is uh, draining their waste nanomaterial waste or nanotechnology waste to nearby some uh, water pollutants water river or some water reservoir so that water reservoir may can cause that uh, toxicity of that particular api or particular nanomaterial to the surrounding of that water reservoir lake some people are living out there some water animals are there fish and a lot of things are there so this can lead to the environmental exposure of that particular uh, api so what is the reason of the particular toxicity so surface area to volume ratio of particles which increases their interaction with the surrounding molecules chemical compositions of the particle which is responsible for its reactivity surface charge of the particle is responsible for the electrostatic interaction the so complementary or nanostructures could cause inhibition of enzyme activity that competitive or its non competitive thing so these are some reason of nanotoxicity in which can lead to some you know some cause of concern to the patient so this much from my side so now it's open for the discussion you guys any doubts you can ask in chat box or you can unmute your mic and ask or posted two links in the chat box on the google drive youtube channel you can access all the previous things from there so uh, when uh, when is the exam do you have any date of the particular exam this is nptel october 28 so today is 12 12 october okay cool yaar good luck guys Post posted question. Okay, so the questions are how to synthesize DNA organism. This synthesis of DNA organism uh, discussed uh, when I read this question. The next question was, will you explain about the synthesis of modified hemoglobin lipolyzed hemoglobin and its applications too? So uh, basically, this uh, lipolyzed hemoglobin solution was lip lipolyzed. One lipolyzed was there. Lipolyzer is there. So uh, the lipolyzed hemoglobin uh, following uh, deoxygenation or addition of several compounds or both to establish protective conditions for obtaining free dried hemoglobin chemically and functionally unaltered and clinically suitable for blood substitutes so there are some different modified modifications uh, synthesis processes are there for this lipolyzed hemoglobin and they are used and sometimes this is used for the detection and treatment of any you know toxicity things which can lead which can decrease the toxic toxicity in any particular organ or particular you no know, human things so this are some application of uh, lipolyzed hemoglobin so i'll uh, there's one article regarding this i'll share that particular art, uh, article with you can you share your email id vijay chitra so i'll uh, share one lipolyzed hemoglobin which i've read the last month so i'll share that uh, good article with you. clear all the doubts from this article just post your email id i'll share that uh, article with you okay cool thank you vijay chitra so anyone have any doubt sir yes sanjeet uh, i have also asked about nanobot whether it will be 
8 disintegrated or the question be eliminated or what is the current status of these nanobots will uh, there be any problem associated with that in the future if nanobots being used how will they be removed or uh, will they get disintegrated see the main uh, issue with the nanobots is is its disintegration of nanobots so likewise we use any polymer in nanomaterials so that polymer is will be disintegrated uh, through the time but the nanobots have the issue of disintegration so that's why uh, the status of the current status of nanobots is nearly impossible to use so we use in some cases but nearly reduced possible status is there so mostly we use uh, uh, rarely in rare chances we can use nanobots uh, in all in alternative of nanobots we can use some uh, metallic nanoparticles in, instead of this nanobot so the most uh, hmm, any any anything else use they will be more or less So uh, you can find this uh, recorded session on the YouTube channel after maybe tomorrow. Okay, cool. I've noted down uh, both of your email address, share a particular uh, article with you guys, and good luck for your exam. So let's conclude this session now. Uh, thank you so much. Was Sorry, Vijay, your voice is sounding. You can just uh, write in chat box. Thank you. Your voice is yeah, sounding. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for your valuable time. Uh, thank you, Vijay. It's most welcome. So, okay, then we'll conclude this meeting now. Thank you so much for your cooperation. So you guys can leave the meeting and I'll share this presentation link uh, in the Google Drive. You can leave the uh, session. Thank you.